Hello, cybersecurity law class. Welcome to this fourth lecture in our module on computer crimes. In this lecture, we kick off a two-part series this week and next week on online safety. And we will talk this week about child pornography, specifically at the federal level. And next week, we will talk about child pornography at the state level. And we will also talk about statutes involving stalking, harassment, cyberbullying, and so on. Now, I've been practicing cyber law for a very long time, since the mid-1990s when I was in practice in the early days of, of the internet, and it's always been an interest of mine. My particular interest in cybersecurity law at the academic level here at the law school started about five or six years ago, uh, and really when I saw an episode of the show 24, and Jack Bauer saves the day from Chinese cyber hackers, and it got me really interested in some of the issues of national security and surveillance uh, and cybercrime and so on that we're talking about. And I really, all along, never paid very much attention to the question of child pornography or online safety. When I first offered a cybersecurity law class here at the law school, it was part of a grant-funded project, and I had gotten some funding from the Bergen County, New Jersey Prosecutor's Office. And I got to know one of the prosecutors there who does computer crimes and found that almost all of his work involves trying to track down and prosecute child pornographers. And uh, I became really interested in and, and passionate about this issue kind of from a social perspective and a law enforcement perspective because I learned about how really uh, horrifying and atrocious this problem is. And at the same time, in reading some of the statutes and case law and trying to think it through a little bit, also became aware as a lawyer about how difficult it is to find ways to try and protect children online without impinging on other people's civil liberties unnecessarily, uh, and while maintaining this unique space that we try to call cyberspace. So to introduce this segment, I'm going to show you a brief uh, video clip of a news report from a couple of years ago involving a large-scale child pornography ring. I have to warn you that um, some of the descriptions in this video uh, are a little bit disturbing. Uh, the truth is that what goes on uh, in this world is really dark and, and really disturbing. So if you want to, you can fast forward it, but if you want to learn a little bit uh, about how at least some parts of this underworld operate, take a look at this video. Now a horrifying story about the largest international child pornography ring ever discovered. U.S. officials say more than 70 people face charges and there could be hundreds more. CBS News Justice correspondent Bob Orr has the latest now from Washington. Bob, good morning. Well, good morning, Chris. As you say, this is an awful case involving the sexual exploitation of dozens, if not hundreds, of children here in the U.S. and abroad by predators who produced and shared kiddie porn on the Internet. The website was called Dreamboard, but beyond the innocent name and colorful graphics lurked a private online club of child molesters dedicated to the sexual abuse of young children. Some of the children featured in these images and videos were just infants. And in many cases, the children being victimized were in obvious and also intentional pain. The child porn cyber trading post shut down this spring. And immigration and customs enforcement agents began arresting dozens of alleged Dreamboard participants. There were no dreams in this case, just the repeated criminal exploitation of young defenseless children. So far, 52 people have been arrested, 43 of them in the United States, including Tennessee police officer Richard Chandler and Virginia high school football coach Joseph Matt Wheeler. Anybody, April Greenway anybody. has children in Wheeler's so, school district. Usually it's the people you think you can trust the most that you really can't trust. More than 600 people are suspected of participating on Dream Board using encrypted files and phony names to hide their identities. Some of the aliases include Professor, Predex, and 14 Years Max, a reference to Dreamboard's goal of featuring the sexual exploitation of kids 12 and younger. Rules for Dreamboard users were strict. Only people who contributed child sex videos could participate, and the most prolific porn producers were rewarded. Membership status was upgraded for those who produced and shared their own child porn and videos. 
Now, more than 500 suspected Dream Board users are still out there somewhere, but those in custody aren't going anywhere. Nearly all are being held now without bail. At the same time, investigators say they're going through a huge amount of material, the equivalent, we're told, of some 16,000 DVDs, trying desperately to identify who the young victims were. First. CBS's Bob Orr in Washington. Bob, thank you. Okay, welcome back. And as you can see from that video, there is some degree of organization within the criminal elements involving child pornography, although it is a very different kind and nature of organization, I think, than most of the sorts of economic crimes that we've looked at. This isn't, I don't think, uh, for the most part, kind of large-scale organized crime from Russia and China and so on. But what it is, is people who think of themselves as, as collectors, uh, who get together in these chat rooms and networks and, and trade these files. But from what the prosecutors whom I've worked with on these kinds of issues tell me, the average person that they uh, prosecute is usually um, a young or a middle-aged guy uh, who's a professional uh, or has some kind of job and gets themselves involved in this and thinks that they're, they're smart enough that they can uh, outsmart law enforcement. Of course, uh, one of the most notable cases of this recently in the news has been the uh, claims against the spokesperson for the subway chain, Jared, uh, who allegedly has been engaging in this kind of conduct. And it just goes to show you that, you know, someone who you would think of as sort of a, a, a respectable middle class or wealthy person um, gets gets involved in these kind of things. Okay, so let's look at some of the legal issues for how the law has, has tried to deal with some of these things. And to set this up, I've asked you to read a, a couple of Supreme Court cases on the question of speech and obscenity. If you think back to our uh, first module in this sequence on internet governance, of course, one of the issues we looked at was speech and anonymity and the notion that something that, that there is some sort of right to anonymity and that something that the internet does is facilitate people being able to speak anonymously. Now, that can be a good thing, and it can have all kinds of benefits, but as we have seen, it can also facilitate all sorts of criminal activity. And the question is, how, if at all, can the law draw lines to try and protect minors and try and protect society in general from things that we might think objectionable? And this line of cases, early line of cases involving obscenity in the pre-internet days leads into our discussion of child pornography today online. So the first case I asked you to look at is really the uh, one of the seminal uh, Supreme Court cases on pornography, which is Miller v. California. And Miller really sets out the current test for determining whether something is considered obscene. The, the background to all of this is that if something is considered obscene, it does not enjoy First Amendment protection. The government can regulate it uh, as obscene and uh, can regulate it facially. But first of all, you have to decide, is it obscene? So uh, Miller is looking at some previous law about uh, what would be a obscene, and this is previous case law, the memoirs case. And the memoirs case uh, has this test that I put up here on the screen, and it's really about um, kind of what is the theme of the material, does it relate to a prurient interest in, in sex, um, relates to contemporary standards, and talks about it being utterly without socially redeeming social value. And in the Miller case, the court says that test isn't really uh, clear enough, isn't really specific enough, and tries to create a somewhat more specific test for deciding whether something is pornography. Um, sorry, whether something is obscene. And so this is the test articulated by Miller. Uh, and, you know, of course, the second part of the test talks about whether it is depicting sexual conduct and has this language in a, in a patently offensive way. Um, but notice the, the two prongs around that, A and C. 
So the first is this community standards problem, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appears to the, appeals to the prurient interest. So we have to ask what community and, and what standards. And then the final part of the test, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So the, the intent of the test is to look to community standards uh, and then to ask, if it is something that's offensive, does it have some other kind of value that, that the First Amendment might protect? And so the relevant community that the Miller Court gives us back in 1973 is a local community. The Miller Court says it's not realistic or sound to suggest that we can kind of aggregate across different communities in the United States, it has this nice colorful language, we can't expect a person from Maine or Mississippi to find, to find tolerable the same things that are found, found tolerable in Las Vegas or New York. Now, there is a dissent in the Miller case from Justice Douglas, and uh, Justice Douglas says that um, this whole idea of community standards is, is really not a good idea. Um, something might be shocking to me, but might not be shocking to my neighbor, uh, and it shouldn't be the case that I could impose uh, sort of my shock on my neighbor. Douglas has some good language, too. What, what causes one person to boil up in rage may reflect only his neuroses, uh, a good sort of 1970s pseudo-Freudian kind of language that we might not quite use as much anymore. Another dissent from Brennan, Stewart, and Marshall saying the statute, particular statute at issue is overbroad. Nevertheless, the majority opinion stands, and that test has, has sort of stood the test of time, at least insofar as it um, hasn't been overturned, and it's kind of a test that, that it's been criticized in various ways, but courts still use. Now we have to ask the question, all right, how does all this apply to the kind of obscene material that we might call child pornography? Do we have to look at child pornography and say, well, you know, in some local community in Las Vegas or some local community in, in New York or wherever it might be, uh, people are a little more accepting of this kind of thing. And the answer the Supreme Court said was no, and this is New York versus Ferber. So Ferber says, okay, uh, if we're dealing with uh, work that is involving children, do, does the state have more, more latitude than Miller might otherwise apply to prohibit that? And uh, Justice White issues the majority opinion, writes the majority opinion, uh, and White says, yes, the, the prurient interest standard is going to be relaxed when it comes to depictions of children. Effectively, the Supreme Court is saying, this is really always appealing to the prurient interest. We don't have to kind of show what the average person in the community would think. This is as sort of a policy matter. We're saying if it's uh, involving depiction of sexual acts and children, it's, it's already going to satisfy that part of the test. We also don't have to look at whether it's a patently offensive manner. Again, we're kind of assuming it's patently offensive as, as sort of just a, a policy decision. We don't need to consider the material as a whole. We can say that, you know, there might be a lot of other stuff in this material that uh, is not offensive. Maybe there's stuff that's, that's just uh, adult pornography that in some communities wouldn't uh, fail the Miller test, or maybe it's stuff that is just pushing the edge that doesn't involve children, or maybe it's stuff that's to totally benign. Uh, even if there's one scene kind of involving what we might call uh, child pornography or depiction of child sexual acts, we can look at that and say that alone could allow regulation of this. And there's a bunch of uh, policy reasons which uh, probably are intuitive to you from the Ferber case. Um, there is, of course, a compelling state interest in the protection of children. Uh, there's really no other way to um, stop the kind of trade that already existed then in child pornography. Um, there is a, an intrinsic connection between the production of child pornography and the abuse of children. Um, we, we presume that children don't have the uh, emotional, intellectual capacity and so on to really consent to these kind of activities, and we don't want to presume that. Uh, 
Uh, and so there's always a question of, of abuse. And as you saw in that little video clip, and if, if you talk to any of the people that prosecute this, there's some really horrific abuse uh, that does go on. There, there is an economic motive to produce it. People are making money off of this material, and we want to stop that. Um, there's really not much value, if any, in any of this, in any of this kind of material. Uh, and because the, the uh, problem, the evil that is sought to be prevented by the law is so extraordinary, we don't have to really look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis, but we can, uh, the court says, we can really look at this at, on kind of a global policy basis and make a decision that this kind of material really doesn't have any, any protection at all. Um, now, there are some kind of limitations in the Ferber case, and one of those is talking about, well, you know, what about other material that depicts sexual conduct <clears throat> that isn't otherwise obscene, uh, doesn't involve uh, a live performance or a, a reproduction of a live performance, doesn't involve this kind of thing with, with uh, children, does this retain First Amendment protection? And part of what's, what's getting at here is um, something like a medical manual, right? So a, um, let's say, a medical text on adolescence, which has uh, pictures of prepubes prepubescent children. Uh, you know, that kind of thing, the court is trying to say, wouldn't be considered obscene. It's a different kind of purpose. So see, even here, even with the Ferber case, it's difficult to draw these these kinds of can be difficult to draw these kinds of lines, and in the Ferber case, ultimately the court says the statute at issue was not overbroad. Um, it was pretty well targeted toward the kind of uh, child pornography materials that the court has said can be regulated. So take note of the concurrences in this case because they highlight some fault lines that are going to show up in some of the next cases that we'll look at. So Justice Blackman with O'Connor says, you know, even if we were to say that some piece of material has some literary, scientific, or educational value, it still could be constitutionally banned because of this compelling overriding interest in, uh, in protecting children. Justice Brennan with Justice Marshall, on the other hand, says, well, wait a minute. If we read this, if this statute were applied to material that had serious artistic literary value, that could be a real problem. And as applied, the statute could be unconstitutional, though that wasn't the kind of material at issue in this case. So Brennan and Marshall were willing to go along with the majority in this case. And then there's Justice Stevens. And Justice Stevens, again, uh, writes to say that this defendant had traded material that was clearly uh, salacious, but there are other kinds of conduct that might not be covered. And you'll see Justice Stevens kind of show up uh, several times again in some of these later cases. Justice Stevens, very concerned about um, not impinging on First Amendment values. So there you've got kind of the basic outline of obscenity law and then the kind of stronger protections for children and even less protection for material that could be called child pornography. But the next group of cases we're going to look at uh, deal with statutes that were now moving into the Internet age. Miller and Ferber, of course, are, are pre-Internet age cases. Child pornography was, was still a, a pretty significant problem before the Internet. But if you think about it, it had to involve... Um, you know, Super 8 kind of movies on, on reels. It had to involve actual hard copy pictures that maybe could be photocopied a couple times. Later on, it, it could involve uh, VHS tapes. But the just as the ability to digitally reproduce perfect copies and distribute them has facilitated all kinds of incredible commerce and scholarship, and just as it's also facilitated piracy of music and movies, it's facilitated the um, exponential growth of the trade in um, what we might call legitimate pornography or, or lawful pornography, as well as unlawful contraband like, like child pornography. So now, uh, at, in the, at the kind of dawn of the Internet age, there are statutes that are trying to address this. And 
one of the initial problems that the legislature tried to address, the Congress tried to address, is well, what about something that might be considered virtual child pornography? What about images that um, are sort of just innocent images of children that then are manipulated to, to become sexualized? Um, what about images that are of adults, people over the age of 18, who are made to look like children? Um, what about images that are created entirely virtually, that um, as technology gets better, it, it look less like cartoons and more like real things? How do we deal with that kind of in- imagery? And it really does raise uh, a conundrum, as you'll see in these cases. And to kind of illustrate that, and in the next case that we'll look at, there is mention of um, some pl- some plays and literary works and movies. So Romeo and Juliet is mentioned, and this this movie Traffic is mentioned. Uh, if you've seen this movie Traffic, it it's uh, about the drug trade. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's a, it's really just a, a a compelling and kind of gripping movie about the devastating effects of the drug trade on young people and their families and communities and and so on. Um, but if you've seen it, you'll know that there, there are, it depicts a teenage girl who, from sort of a, a relatively affluent suburban family, uh, her father is played by Michael Douglas. This teenage girl gets caught up in the drug trade. She becomes a, a heroin addict. And there are a number of scenes that uh, depict sexuality involving this teenage girl. Now, of course, the, the girl is played by an adult actress, so it is not an actual teenage girl in these scenes. It's an adult, but she's playing a teenage girl. Now I'm going to show you one really brief clip from the movie. And again, uh, there's um, some disturbing content in this clip. If you want to fast forward it, you can. I'm really only going to show you the very last few seconds of this scene. If, you're, if you've seen the movie, you'll recognize the scene. And there's um, you know, probably five or six or more seconds before it that are even a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more obvious even what's going on than what you'll see in this clip. But you'll, you'll get the idea when you see this little bit of clip. Uh, take a look at it or fast forward if you want, and then we'll come back to it. Okay, so you see in in that scene, within the context of this film, it depicts this girl's drug dealer um, having sexual sex with the girl. Uh, the it's an adult actress playing a teenage girl. She's obviously trading her her body for uh, the drugs, and there's a kind of whole point that's being made in the context of the whole movie about what she's doing. So that leads us to the Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition case in the Supreme Court and the Child uh, Pornography Prevention Act of 1996. Now, one of the things that that statute tried to do is deal with this question of uh, virtual child pornography. So there's a few pieces of the statute. Notice that center bullet talks about computer morphing. So this this is the notion that you have a uh, picture of a a child that is um, modified in some way to become sexualized, that piece of this statute wasn't uh, challenged. Um, but 
you have these other provisions, and in particular, you have this provision about virtual child pornography, so a visual depiction um, that is or that appears to be of a minor engaging in sexually explicit conduct. And, and you know, one of the issues in this case is the question of whether a film like Traffic, that scene that we just saw in Traffic, um, would be captured by this kind of thing and, and, and whether it should be. So the majority opinion in Ashcroft, written by Justice Kennedy, joined by Stephen Souter Ginsburg and Breyer, holds that the statute is unconstitutional. So the reasoning of the majority opinion is that you know, um, our society, like every society throughout history, is fascinated with the lives of the young. Our literature includes stories about the lives of the young, and that, that includes all parts of their lives, including their sexuality. And the court talks about uh, Romeo and Juliet and stories such as that. The interest in Ferber is in protecting real children. And the court says there's no demonstrated connection between the production of virtual child pornography and any damaging impacts on real children. There were some arguments floating around that virtual child pornography sort of feeds people's obsession with real child pornography. The court didn't, uh, the majority didn't buy that argument. There was also an, uh, an argument that this virtual child pornography could actually fall into the hands of children and hurt them that way. And the majority says, well, there's lots of stuff that could fall into the hands of children and be damaging to them, but we can't ban adult speech. The law can't ban adult speech on that reason, on that basis. There have to be other kinds of parental responsibility and other kinds of responsibility to deal with that. There was also an argument that uh, the um, virtual images are so close to the real images that they feed the same kind of market, and the majority says, well, if they were really that good, then actually the illegal images would be driven from the market. Um, you know, everybody would just use virtual. In effect, what the majority is saying, you know, the virtual images really aren't that good. They're, they're, most of them don't even really look like real children. Now, remember, this is a case from the 90s. Uh, the technology has gotten significantly, uh, you know, the imaging technology has gotten significantly better since then. But there, here's what the court says then. Um, and... Uh, you can't use um, protected speech to, uh, you can't ban protected speech as a way of banning unprotected speech. That is, um, there is some realm that is unprotected. Um, and if you're worried that there's a protected realm that you have to sort of set a bigger fence around, that's going to be a problem. you got to try to set the fence very specifically only around the unprotected realm. The majority also says that the part of the statute that would uh, criminalize material that conveys the impression that it involves child pornography is unconstitutional. And here the majority says this could capture a lot of things like simply a trailer that seems to suggest the film has sexually explicit content involving children where the trailer itself doesn't have sexually explicit content uh, but it seems to convey that the movie might, but the movie, in fact, doesn't. And the court says that would go too far. Again, that would be kind of building a fence around the protected stuff when you need to build the fence only around the unprotected stuff, according to the majority opinion. So there are some other opinions in, in this case as well. Justice Thomas writes a concurrence. And uh, Thomas says, well... Uh, Okay, for now. For now, uh, Thomas says, I agree. The technology isn't really that good. If uh, prosecutors are looking at some material with, with um, relative ease and relative consistency, they can say, well, this is a real child. This is virtual material. And so it won't impinge on the ability of prosecutors to track down real child pornographers. But Justice Thomas says, if the technology, the imaging uh, and graphics technology gets to the point where it's uh, hard to distinguish virtual from real, then he thinks the balance would shift uh, and the kind of impacts of the virtual on real children would be enough 
to allow the statute to be upheld. And then there's a partial concurrence, partial dissent by Justice O'Connor, joined by Justice Scalia. And so O'Connor says that the um, statute should only be stricken down to the extent it applies to what she calls youthful adult pornography. What she means by that is, is things like the movie Traffic, where there's actually an adult actress playing a child. And, you know, if you're sort of any kind of reasonable person watching the movie, you know that this is a depiction by an adult actress and it's in a certain kind of context. That kind of thing, uh, O'Connor and Scalia agree, should be um, struck down. That kind of bar should be struck down. But the other pieces of the statute, they say, should have been upheld. And they say, you know, otherwise, O'Connor says otherwise, that this ban reflects a very compelling interest. And she buys the argument, she and Scalia buy the argument that the virtual uh, child pornography feeds the market for real child pornography. And uh, Scalia and O'Connor agree that the conveys the impression ban is unconstitutional. So Justice Rehnquist writes a dissent, and Rehnquist is, is uh, also joined in part by Justice Scalia. And Rehnquist here says, if you look carefully at the definition in the statute, um, and it, where it defines sexually explicit conduct, most of the concerns of the majority would go away. Uh, it would really only cover hardcore child pornography. It would not cover, according to Rehnquist, things like Romeo and Juliet or even a movie like Traffic. Finally, Rehnquist says that the, even the conveys the impression ban should be upheld because... In his view, this really um, goes after people who are actually pandering toward child pornographers and the child pornography market and not to other people who might you know, happen to see a movie or, 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 or rent or buy a movie um, because of something they saw in a trailer. So you see some of those fault lines there and some of the questions among members of the court and some of the policy issues and arguments that underlie some of those questions. One of the things that I find kind of interesting and also frustrating about a case like this in the Supreme Court is that, you know, there, as the Supreme Court often, often does, I think, they're making these kind of big policy judgments about, well, how much would something like a market in virtual child pornography affect the market for real child pornography? And there isn't a whole lot of empirical evidence, if any, before the court. There isn't, there isn't a, uh, often a very well-developed record. I don't know that in these cases there's a very well-developed record, and I'm not even sure uh, how you would study something like that. So there's always this kind of dynamic of um, how you're trying to weigh this sort of evidence at this, at this very high level of the Supreme Court. Well, subsequent to the Ashcroft case, and actually subsequent to a couple of the other cases that we'll also look at in a moment, Congress did revisit this issue of virtual child pornography in something called the PROTECT Act. And this was the PROTECT Act of 2003. And so these, these uh, portions of the previous law involving virtual child pornography were uh, amended to try to address some of the concerns that the Supreme Court had. And if you look at the statute now, it defines child pornography, um, and it's got this uh, definition here of various means of reproduction, sexually explicit conduct, and here's, here's how they try to make it particular. Involves the use of a minor, so an actual child, um, a digital image, computer image, computer-generated image that is or is indistinguishable from a minor engaging in sexually explicit conduct, and this is really trying to I think get at uh, Justice Thomas's hint in his concurrence that if the technology gets better, the statute could be upheld. Um, and the visual depiction is created, adapted, so on to appear that an identifiable minor, uh, or sorry, or that the depiction is created so that an, so that it appears to be an identifiable minor. And this is really getting at this again, this idea of morphing, that there's there is a minor, and the the, the picture is then kind of changed to make it uh, sexually explicit. The statute defines uh, 
uh, identifiable minor. And you can kind of um, look at the definition there. Um, one of the kind of key pieces in this definition of identifiable minor, and we'll see this again next week when we talk about New Jersey law on virtual child pornography. There is a New Jersey Supreme Court case on this under the New Jersey statute. And, you know, one of the questions is, well, what would a prosecutor have to prove to, uh, you know, show that it's an identifiable minor? And um, so here the statute says it's recognizable as an actual person, but you don't have to show who the actual minor was. Um, you know, so for example, what if somebody just grabs a random image of a child off of Google Images uh, and, you know, manipulates that to make it appear sexually explicit and then kind of trades it or sells it as, ch as child pornography. And there's no way to really trace who the original image uh, was of. It still would satisfy the statute. So indistinguishable, notice that definition as well, because that's an important definition. Um, and I think you can see by reading it, it's the, you know, Congress is sort of struggling with a way to kind of define this. Indistinguishable means virtually indistinguishable. An ordinary person would would conclude that it's an uh, that it's an actual minor, and it's trying to exclude drawings, cartoons, sculptures, uh, uh, paintings, and and so on. So um, those are going to raise. The, uh, so this part of the statute is still in force, the, and these these uh, modifications are still in force. Um, there are issues about how they get applied, what that means, and we'll look a little bit more at that piece of it under state law next week. Okay, and this leads us now to a discussion of the Communications Decency Act. So the uh, Communications Decency Act was a uh, big deal in the late 1990s. It was another uh, kind of early effort by Congress to deal with a range of issues around pornography, obscenity, and the like on the internet. And it was uh, kind of within the internet law community at the time, another one of these big causes. I mean, the, the sort of the copy left, the cyber exceptionalist um, elements of internet law at the time were really outraged by this statute um, and, you know, really felt like it was a significant impingement on, on free speech. And of course, it gets challenged in various ways, including this challenge by the ACLU, which gets up to the Supreme Court. So what the statute did, and kind of the parts that, that we're looking at tonight, it's about the ability of young people, of children, to access pornography and other types of material of that sort online. Now notice this is not a child pornography statute. It is a statute that involves any kind of obscene material that a, a minor might be able to access. So it prohibited transmission of uh, um, obscene or indecent material if the transmitter n knew that the recipient was under 18. Um, same thing about sending or displaying that kind of material. It had some defenses uh, built in. Um, so, you know, if you took some good faith actions to restrict access by minors, um, and it created a safe harbor by saying if you require credit card verification or an adult uh, ID number or, or code to verify that the user is an adult, then that, would, that could be a safe harbor. So you can see what this statute is trying to do is trying to say to any um, provider of internet content that uh, if there's any chance that the material is going to be obscene and is going to be uh, able to be accessed by a child, which really you can't know for sure who's going to access your stuff um, on the internet, then you would have to have some kind of means of, of verification. It was really trying to force some kind of means of, of verification. And so here again, the uh, court finds this, stat this part of this statute unconstitutional. And now you have a, a majority opinion by Justice Stevens. As I mentioned, Stevens is a, a strong defender of the of First Amendment values, and Stephen says this is, it's a blanket restriction on certain kinds of speech. It's not, in his opinion, just a time, place, or manner restriction. Notice this quote, and this is where, uh, a place where U.S. Supreme Court law is perhaps at the height of what we called cyber exceptionalism in our module on, our, our first module on internet 
governance. So notice this quote, never before or after has the vast, have the vast democratic fora of the internet been subject to this kind of government supervision or regulation of the same sort that attends the broadcast industry. And what he's referring to there are the various um, kind of decency rules, censorship rules in public television and, and, and public broadcasting. Stephen says the internet is not as invasive as radio or television. Uh, radio or television, you turn it on and it's on. Uh, and, you know, it's on in the family room. And if, and if one, of the, one of the prohibited bad words comes over the air, you know, if there's an F-bomb on your public television show, all the kids will hear it. If, if there are, are naked people on your um, broadcast television show, the, the kids will see it. He says, not so with the internet. Now, I, I think, you know, this is a piece of this case that is perhaps a little bit frozen in amber from 1997. I'm not sure that anyone would really agree that the Internet is not as invasive as radio or television today um, because we all have the Internet in, the po- in our pockets, in our phones, including our kids. And, you know, you might say, well, don't give your kid a phone. You know, if you, if you have a uh, young teenage preteen kid, um, you know, they're going to have a phone and it's partly because you're going to feel safer if they're out somewhere and they, they have a phone and so on. But we all know we all have the internet. It's totally accessible, but this is 1997, you know, and it was a little bit of a different world. All right. So Stevens also says that, um, the statute is not specific enough. The terms aren't well defined. It doesn't really, uh, follow the Miller test for what might or might not be obscene. Um, he suggests that the, 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 the safe harbors and, the, and the, the good faith defenses are, are unfeasible. They're too expensive. The technology to implement them doesn't really exist uh, in any sort of meaningful way. Um, you know, that piece of this case is, is kind of interesting. To some extent, that's probably still true. Um, you know, if somebody wants to get around a verification technology, they probably can get around it. To some extent, it's not true. I mean, people have talked about um, biometrics, for example, um, having some kind of requirement for a, a fingerprint reader or something along those lines for certain kind of sites. Uh, it certainly is technologically feasible, but it involves uh, expense and uh, transaction costs, you know, the time and effort to do it. And, you know, note, again, this kind of strong piece of cyber exceptionalism. Stephen says the CDA threatens to torch Great word from Justice Stevens to torch a li- large segment um, of the internet community. And ultimately, Stevens says this statute could only be upheld to the extent it's really targeted toward the kind of obscene speech that, that you could regulate under the Miller test. So again, here we have a robust debate among members of the court with some concurrences and dissents. So we have a concurrence and partial concurrence, partial dissent from Justice O'Connor. Notice you've got Stevens, kind of the very strong uh, First Amendment view. You have O'Connor, as she often does in these cases and as well as in uh, other kinds of cases, kind of occupying this middle, trying to find some kind of middle space. And O'Connor is looking at this as a kind of zoning regulation. So O'Connor says, you can... Uh, have zoning regulations that deal with uh, obscene material or a material that is is kind of questionable. So, you know, even if it might not be possible in a particular area to completely ban all pornographic literature or pornographic movies um, under the Miller test, you could uh, zone and say you can only buy those things in the red light district. And, you know, those kind of zoning regulations generally the court uh, had had upheld unless they're you know really just um, kind of subterfuge for banning the material but generally the zoning regulations are upheld but notice again a really strong element of cyber exceptionalism in this case here from Justice O'Connor and O'Connor says cyberspace the electronic world is fundamentally different fundamentally different cyberspace allows speakers and listeners to mask their identity Uh, And so what she's saying here is, you know, you really can't do this kind of zoning in cyberspace. It's just not really possible to say, 
you know, 42nd Street is the red light district. Of course, now it's the Disney district, but, you know, years past, 42nd Street is the red light district, um, and this is the family district. He, she says, you can't do that online. But note this. She does say cyberspace is ma malleable. It could be feasible in the future to create adult-only zones if the technology develops to allow that. Again, this case, 1997. Uh, so she says, in with existing technology, the, the Communications Decency Act should have been upheld in the narrow circumstance where the party initiating the communication knows that all the recipients are minors. When would that happen? I mean, it might be in a, a particular chat room or a particular email um, or something along along those lines, but um, in that narrow case. But notice that O'Connor does leave open the possibility that if technology makes that kind of zoning possible, you know, maybe the statute could be constitutional. So after the court strikes down the CDA, Congress tries again with a statute called the Child Online Protection Act, or COPA. And COPA has a very long history through the courts, and that's why I call it the COPA saga. So COPA statute says said that whoever knowingly and with knowledge of the character of the material in interstate commerce foreign commerce or by means of the world wide web a specific reference here to the web makes any communication for commercial purposes that is available to any minor and that includes material harmful to minors it is unlawful it defines a minor as a person under 17 years of age and defines material harmful to minors to track the miller obscenity test now, the district court issues a preliminary injunction against the enforcement of the statute. It goes up to the uh, Court of Appeals and then goes up to the Supreme Court. So the posture is that there's a preliminary injunction finding the statute um, unconstitutional that gets up to the Supreme Court. So the majority opinion authored by Justice Thomas, the majority as to the result, you'll see there are a number of uh, different opinions, and there is no kind of majority as to the reasoning, but there is a majority to the result. The majority as to the result is to say, well, kind of the facial challenge saying that uh, this reliance on community standards renders the statute substantially overbroad, it's, it's not specific enough, it's not detailed enough, um, the statute is not facially overbroad, it can refer to the community standards under the Miller test. But as you'll see, what ends up happening is that the case is remanded for further proceedings, and then it comes back to the Supreme Court again. So before we get there, let's talk about uh, some of the other opinions about the reasoning. So uh, Tom Thomas's reasoning is joined by Scalia, Rehnquist, and O'Connor. And, you know, the, the issue here is whether the community standard has to be a local standard. So this statute is trying to establish uh, a national standard for what kind of material could be available to children. And the, the uh, facial challenge was to say Miller requires a local standard. And uh, Thomas's reasoning, here joined by Scalia, Rehnquist, O'Connor, says, no, it doesn't have to be a local standard. Miller permits a local standard, but doesn't require a local standard. Um, the definition in COPA of the kind of material uh, that is defined as, as uh, prohibited is material that applies, appeals to the prurian interest. It has no literary or scientific value, and therefore the definitions in the statute really limit the kind of material that, that could be covered. Um, and you know, notice this, another sort of bit of uh, cyber exceptionalism creeping in here. Thomas says, if we were to hold this unconstitutional, what we would say is that there can be no federal obscenity law as applied to the web because the web is not local, right? The web transcends localities. And if you're going to have to uh, say that kind of the most permissive locality that's available on the web is the one that must govern, uh, you know, then effectively you're saying there, there can't be any regulation at all. And uh, Thomas says, you know, if a publisher chooses in, in sort of the brick and mortar world, if a publisher chooses to send material to a particular community, then that community standards are going to 
you know, the publisher is going to have to abide by that community's standards for the purpose of obscenity law. And the fact is, if you're distributing your material to every community in the nation, then you have to presume that you're sending it to very restrictive communities as well as very permissive communities. And so ultimately, um, the result here is to vacate the uh, holding that the statute is invalid and to send it back uh, to the Court of Appeals, actually, for further proceedings to develop um, how this standard would actually apply to the statute at issue. Now, Justice O'Connor, again, uh, concurs. Connor um, says, in fact, that a national community standard is necessary for Internet obscenity. Notice, that, again, this, this thread in O'Connor, in O'Connor's jurisprudence of the Internet, uh, of, of, at this period in time, of, of pretty significant cyber exceptionalism. Uh, further, O'Connor says, this notion that there are these local communities, like what's, per, what's permissible in Maine, uh, might not, you know, might be less than what's permissible in, in Las Vegas or New York is kind of collapsing. And part of the reason it's collapsing is exactly because of the internet. Justice Kennedy writes a concurrence joined by Souter and Ginsburg. Kennedy ultimately agrees with the decision to remand. Um, but Kennedy says that the web complicates all this, uh, you know, how do you judge something as a whole, judge the work as a whole, as the Miller test requires, when the work is in the context of the web? In effect, Kennedy is, again, sounding a note of cyber exceptionalism. What is the work? Is it that individual file? Or is it that file in the context of a variety of other things on a website? Or is it that file in the context of the whole World Wide Web? How do you judge the work as a whole? Do you effectively have to judge um, the work as, as a whole? And uh, Justice Kennedy says, really what's going on here is we need more factual development. We need to know more about who the material that's uh, at issue in a particular case is trying to reach um, and um, who it's actually reaching and how that applies to the to the interconnected context of the internet as a whole. Justice Stevens dissents. So Stevens says, really uh, kind of takes O'Connor and to some extent uh, Kennedy's arguments and flips them on their head and says, we can't use uh, any kind of community standards on the internet. Uh, and he you know uses this nice little zinger here, if a prurient appeal and is offensive in a Puritan village, it may be a crime to post it on the web. And he is saying that there is simply no way to segregate speech on the internet. The internet is available to everyone all at once, uh, and there simply is no way to have separate areas or, or ways in which you can discern that a child in, in some very conservative community might have access to the material. And Stevens even goes a little further and says, you know, the, the prurient interest aspect of the Miller test is hard to apply with respect to these kinds of things because he says really almost any depiction of nudity appeals to the prurient interest of a minor. I think he has in mind here, you know, like a 13-year-old boy or something like that. Stevens does say... That, that kind of really hardcore por pornography really shouldn't be on, on the internet, but we just effectively can't regulate this. And, um, you know, notice again here, flipping it on its head, but a note of cyber exceptionalism. Um, we, in the real world, we can find communities and places where if we share a certain kind of uh interest in sexually explicit speech, we can do that and other people don't have to directly be affected by it. If we don't want that, we can separate ourselves out from it. But we just can't do that in, and he uses the word, cyberspace. We just can't do that in, in cyberspace. Okay, so the case gets remanded. Uh, the Court of Appeals looks at it again under uh, the new 
articulation of this, as confused as it is that the Supreme Court gives them. And perhaps not surprisingly, the Court of Appeals says, uh, yep, we're going to uh, affirm the district court's injunction. We're going to say that the statute uh, is unconstitutional. And then it comes back up to the Supreme Court. The court takes it once again on cert. And so now Justice Kennedy writes the majority opinion. And now Justice Kennedy is, is going to address this in a framework that's sort of more consistent with traditional First Amendment jurisprudence, uh, and particularly First Amendment jurisprudence aimed at the content of speech. And he asks whether this statute is the least restrictive means of advancing the purpose of trying to protect minors from having access to this. And he says no. He says users can implement on their own filtering and blocking software if they want to. And that kind of software, he says, can be relatively effective. Um, it can't be mandated by Congress, but it can be encouraged by Congress. And really what he's saying is it's, you know, it's up to the family, it's up to the parent to put software on the system that will filter this kind of material out. So under Kennedy's opinion, the uh, district court's injunction is left in place. The case is remanded to the trial court for a full trial on the merits, and in particular on, the, on this factual question that Kennedy has raised and already indicated his views on as to whether filters are less effective than the COPA statute. And Kennedy says the factual record uh, doesn't really reflect the current technological reality, and Kennedy here is kind of signaling that he believes the filtering technology only gets better and better and better, and that it's very likely that the trial court is going to find that it's effective, it's more effective than a statute would be. And he says the government has not shown that uh, the less restrictive alternatives, that is the filtering technology, um, should be just disregarded. So he, he sends the case back to the trial court. There is also an opinion by, uh, and a concurring opinion by Justice Stevens, and Stevens is uh, joined by Ginsburg. And um, Stevens writes to suggest that he believes COPA is really extremely restrictive. Now, unlike Thomas, who thinks, ah, it's not really that restrictive. Kennedy, who thinks, well, it's it's pretty restrictive. And in fact, there's, least, there's less restrictive alternative. Stevens wants to say it's extremely restrictive. And in particular, again, see Stevens' concern here. He thinks setting up a criminal prosecution for... Uh, Speech is just a bad idea. He really is doesn't like the Miller test, uh, if you kind of read read between the lines here. Breyer, Justice Breyer, is, uh, writes a dissent. Breyer is joined by, in his dissent, by Rehnquist and O'Connor. Uh, and uh, Breyer wants to suggest that, in fact, the requirements in the statute are not that burdensome, and that the uh, on the record before the court, the court could decide that the filtering software uh, is really not more effective and not less burdensome than the statute itself. So Breyer says, you know, age verification, that's really only a very modest burden on speech. Most commercial pornography sites already require you to verify your, to have a credit card to buy the stuff. Um, that's, of course, commercial sites. Uh, and he says, you know, it might be all well and good for the market to encourage individuals to adopt, to use filtering software, but that's not, a, that's not an alternative legislative approach. So notice Breyer is saying the least restrictive alternative means the least restrictive government alternative, not the least restrictive alternative that a private individual or the market might choose to adopt. So a very kind of interesting, even jurisprudential difference there. And uh, Breyer says, he, Breyer is not as sanguine about the filtering technology that's in existence either in 2004 or on the immediate horizon. And he says, filtering software doesn't really work that well. It underblocks. Um, it costs the family to buy it and to use it. Um, it doesn't work outside the home. It's not very precise. And I think most of us who, even now in 2015, are familiar with filtering software, if you have little kids in your family and you've tried to use some kind of parental controls, uh, 
um, you know that you know they 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 may be better than nothing, but they really don't work very well. Justice Scalia writes a dissent. So Scalia says um, this kind of material actually could be banned entirely under the existing Supreme Court ju- jurisprudence of Miller, uh, and he thinks. COPA's restrictions don't raise any constitutional concern at all. This is not, in his view, protected speech. So the saga continues. Now, I did not give you, just because you had so much reading material already this week, uh, I didn't give you the additional case in this saga, which is actually a Third Circuit case. So the case goes uh, the, the case goes back to the district court. There's a trial on the merits. And after the trial on the merits, the district court, in accordance with The Supreme Court's decision does, in fact, find that filtering software is a least restrictive alternative, that it that it can be effective, that it's likely to be more effective than the statute issues a permanent injunction against enforcement of the statute that is appealed to the Third Circuit. The Third Circuit uh, and in in the district court after the trial, the district court found that the alternatives, credit card verification um, is very costly, that it results in lost traffic, that it's not very effective because a minor can get around that too by taking their parents' uh, uh, credit card. There's an interesting argument there about whether some kind of credit card verification is like blinder racks. In other words, you know, if there's a, a, a bookstore where that has hardcore porn, it might be behind some blinds or b- behind a, a red door or something like that. Um, and he says that's not the same thing because, you know, you have to kind of uh, have a credit card and pay to have access and relinquish your anonymity, which aren't things that you ne- necessarily have to do in, um, in, in real space. Uh, so after the uh, Third Circuit issues this judgment, there is another petition for certiorari, and at this point, the Supreme Court <laughs> seems kind of exhausted of all this and denies cert. Um, and that's where the case ends. Copa uh, went to the Third Circuit to die and died there. Um, and there, you know, unlike the virtual child pornography where we saw the Protect Act, there has not been uh, any other effort or any any effort in Congress that's gotten anywhere. Congress has not passed any other legislation that's trying to restrict the access of minors to, you know, obscene material or other kinds of content on the internet. So we can ask a few questions and I'll kind of leave you with these questions and and we can take some of these up in class on Thursday. After the failure of the Communications Decency Act and COPA, is there any way to construct a constitutionally valid statute that would or could restrict a child's access to obscene and indecent materials on, on the internet? Um, is the the default solution adopted by the court, which is voluntary self-regulation, um, really the best solution as kind of adequate or inadequate as it is? I want you to think about for, as we think about next week, and you, you start to do the readings for next week, and we will do some things on state child pornography law, but we're also going to talk about um, online harassment, cyber stalking, cyber speech that incites violence and terrorism, and cyber bullying. All of these are uh, also very large, difficult social problems that we're facing today. And as you'll see next week, there's a range of federal and state law that tries to address this and a bunch of case law. But how do, how do these rulings on these child pornography and child access statutes um, relate to all of these other things. Can we regulate harassment or cyber, cyber stalking or any, or any kind of conduct online? Or is, or is the internet so exceptional that things that we would ordinarily touch in, in the real world with criminal law, we can't touch in the cyber world? One other note I want to leave you with, there is, uh, again, another statute and Supreme Court case that I didn't ask you to read because you had so much to read. Um, but there is another statute called the Children's Internet Protection Act. This statute says that um, libraries and other places that receive government funding um, that have internet access are required to adopt filtering and blocking software. That statute also was challenged, and that challenge also went to the Supreme Court, but in that case, the Supreme Court said that the statute was constitutional, that it wasn't 
uh, an undue burden on uh, the rights of freedom of speech or freedom of assembly to have a publicly funded library that has internet access to have to have some kind of filtering and, and verification kind of software. So that's our, our, our first piece of this, dealing with child pornography and protection of children online in terms of their access to material. I'll see you in class on Thursday.